So I'd like to share a scripture reading with you from 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, beginning in the 34th verse. But David said to Saul, now David has come down to visit his brothers because his brothers are a part of the armies of Israel doing battle against the Philistines. And he ends up before Saul, who is the king of Israel, because no one will face the champion of the Philistines, whose name is Goliath. But David said to Saul, your servant, that being David, used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. And Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over his armor and tried in vain to walk. But David, he's still a young man, and he doesn't have the, uh, well, the stature of a man yet. He wasn't used to them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them, and he took off his staff, took his staff in his hand, and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came, on, came out and drew near to David, with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance, of course. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give, you flesh, give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we don't often turn to our Old Testament, Testament scriptures anymore. Most of the time, we will spend our time in that other testament, the New Testament. But I, I mean, occasionally you'll hear still a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments. And, and uh, the psalm, most of the Psalms, people still like to cherish them, but though some of them have fallen out of disfavor as well. When's the last time you heard a sermon about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their fiery furnace? how they had defied the king's command to worship an idol, and when they would not worship it, he took them and cast them into the furnace. I remember as a kid that there was a, a musical for children called There's Fire in the Furnace. And one of the songs went like this. It's cool in the furnace. It's cool in the furnace. Uh, that's a song that catches uh, the imagination of a child and a story. How about the, the sermon, a sermon on the people of Israel walking around the walls of Jericho for seven days and blowing their horns, and on the final day, blowing them for a long time, and the walls of that city came crumbling down, and then all the children are taught the song, right? Taught the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. One of my favorite stories is Daniel and the lion's den. In the evening, he was cast into the lion den, lion's den, and their intention that he would be an evening snack for the lions. Well, when the doors were open in the morning, Daniel stepped out of the lion's den, his faith in God intact, as well as his arms and his legs as well. Today, well, actually this week, 
I was talking to my two-year-old grandson, and I asked him, what did you learn in Sunday school that he lives uh, far away? And, and he said, well, there was a garden, and there was Adam, and there was Eve, and then his fi- favorite part, he did it like this, and a snake. He was pretty excited about that story. I heard one, pa- heard one pastor say that he was abandoning the Old Testament because it's uh, too hard to understand and too difficult to teach. I wondered about that because how do you teach about creation if you don't have those first, first chapters of Genesis? And your whole story of, of uh, the history of salvation becomes impoverished because Jesus was not the first act of God's salvation. It was the final act of God's salvation. It becomes much richer when you have the whole history of God standing on your side and standing on my side. So we're going to use the Old Testament today, and particularly this story of David and Goliath. I've always thought, in fact, that this moment in David's life was the high, high, m- highest moment of his life, which is kind of sad because he has a whole, whole, whole lot of life left in front of him. But in fact, I'm going to be honest with you, David is not one of my favorite biblical personalities. In fact, the latter part of his life puts David in the same category as Jezebel. And I got to tell you, Jezebel doesn't have a very good reputation. We only have to look at the facts. In one despicable act, David breaks almost all of God's commandments. He lusted after Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And when Bathsheba became pregnant by David, he called Uriah, who was fighting the nation's battles on behalf of David, he called him to come home. He hoped that Uriah would spend time with his wife and that when the child was born, Uriah would be fooled into believing that the child was his own. But Uriah was more honorable than David. He wasn't going to spend time in comfort while his men were still in the field doing battle on behalf of the nation of Israel. And so when it became obvious that that Uriah would not be fooled and that David's sin would become public, David sent word ahead. In fact, he sent it with Uriah, but sealed so that he would not know that the commanders of the armies of Israel were told to place Uriah at the spear point of the battle at the very front where Uriah would surely die. So he broke these commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. He stole away that which belonged to Uriah, including Uriah's life. You shall not murder. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a carved image. For a time, Bathsheba was his idol and was his God. And you can make a case that he broke the commandment to honor your father and mother because he had brought shame upon his whole family. Later, David would ignore the rape of his daughter Tamar by her half-brother and David's son, Amnon, which infuriated Absalom, who is Tamar's full brother, And would poison all of David's family, Absalom would end up killing Amnon, and then he would lead a rebellion against David. So after the land was settled and peaceful, after Uriah, after all of those things, David had it in his heart to build a temple to signify the presence of God there with the nation of Israel. And God said, David... You will not build it. And the reason given in the 22nd chapter of 1 Chronicles is this. You have shed much blood and fought many wars. And I've always thought to myself, I wonder if it was Uriah's blood, innocent blood, that kind of put it over the top for God Almighty to say then to David, your hands are no longer carry any kind of innocence for me because life is the most sacred thing I have given to you from the time of conception to the time of death. It is my supreme gift. And you took it, took it from Uriah. But it was a different story in his youth. David stands tall in today's story. He is the youngest of his father's sons. 
And because of that, he stays home when his brothers go off to fight Israel's war. And normally that's just after the harvest. And now they have time to do that. It's, it's an odd time to live in. They've gone off to do battle, but David has been sent into the fields to take care of the sheep. And the sheep needed someone to take care of them. I understand that sheep need somebody to take care of them because they are as uh, smart as a brick. And they are sharp as the knife that is used to cut that brick in half. They're just, they just don't have it up here. And so when there are lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they are so frightened that they simply panic. They don't even have an organized defense. It's just whoever can stay in front of the last sheep at that particular moment. And so they need the shepherd there to help take care of them. And that was one of David's roles. In fact, he had two roles. One was as a shepherd and the other one as the pesky little brother. And the scriptures are full of pesky little brothers. I know about that. I have two pesky little brothers. There, uh, when you think about who those pesky bro- little brothers, though, they all seem to be end up pl- um, playing big roles. I mean, you, you simply start with Joseph in his technicolor coat, and he had those dreams about ruling over his brothers. I think I had that dream too, but anyway, he had that dream, and he told that to his brothers, thinking that they would be ecstatic. Well, they were certainly excited, but it was their anger that was excited against their brother. I mean, you can imagine what they said to each other. Who does that pesky fly on a donkey's backside think he is? I mean, that's... There was Jacob. He was also the pesky little brother. He was only born a few moments after Esau, his older brother. But Jacob lived into the very definition of what it means to be a pesky brother. There was nothing really in common with the two. Esau, he was a a big man, a strong man, a man of the field and of adventure. And uh, David, uh, oh, and a man who worked, I mean, uh, worked hard with his hands, while Jacob, his hands were as smooth as silk because he didn't like the hard work. Uh, But he had to make a living. So he's always looking for a way to cheat somebody. In fact, everybody. In fact, there was a point in Jacob's life where there was only two kind of people he knew, those who were angry with him and those who were really, really angry with him. The only two people he knew in his life. And then there is this uh, pesky little brother named David. He wanted to be seen as a man by those who were around him. He's kind of at that age where it's kind of that awkward age where you're moving from being a boy, and you, but you're not quite a man yet, but you want to be seen as a man. But his brothers are always, uh, he was always hanging out with his bigger brothers, and they were always thinking of him as the pesky, pesky little brother and all of that kind of thing. So those brothers had gone off to do battle because they had grown in stature. They were full-grown men. And now David has been sent down to take them supplies. The armies in those days... Um, Just like any other army, you have to be well fed in order to do battle. But in those days, your family fed you or you didn't eat. So his father called David out of the field, gave him some food, said, take it to your brothers. He went down there. And I suspect that he was pretty excited. He's going to see battle. And when you see battle from far off, it seems so heroic and brave and clean. And then you get up near to it, and it's about fear. And it's about taking, taking care of yourself and the one to your right and the one to your left. It's about blood and the death of men and and some that seem even like boys. But David's excited. When he arrives, though, there is a spectacle taking place, but not what David thought. There's no clash of metal, of swords being uh, one against the other. There's no, uh, no triumphant rushing of the armies of Israel down upon the Philistines. There's one guy standing in the middle of the field, and he's seven feet tall. There are some, uh, some, uh, uh, ver- some places where it says he was nine feet tall, but those are later versions of the story. It's kind of like the fish story. I had a fish this big. I had a fish this big. The third time you tell it, it's this big. And so he grew from seven to nine feet. Seven feet tall is still a big man back then because most, I mean, the average uh, Israelite was just over five feet. And he was down on the field. And the armies of Israel hid behind their rocks. And he called out, why don't you prepare for battle? I'm a Philistine, am I not? And you're the Israelites. 
Just send out your champion and we'll do battle. And if I defeat him, you will be our servants. And if you defeat me, if he defeats me, we will be your servants. And no one stood up. Not even Saul, the warrior king. They all were frightened. But not David, not the pesky little brother. He said, well, if nobody else will, I will. Go home, said his brothers. No, said Saul, come to my palace. And there he put on all of his armor, and David said, I can't wear all of this. It's too heavy for me. And he went down to the creek, and he picked up five. He needed smooth stones because they would fly sure. He picked up five of those stones. You know, the truth is we all have, we all have giants in our lives. We all have giants in our lives. If you haven't met one yet, you will eventually meet a giant in your life. Maybe it's because of a death that's happened in your life. Maybe it's your own illness. Maybe it's a lost job. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's that you just have a lack of direction. You can't see where to go next. And a giant stands up in your life. I've had people in my life who uh, have had to tell other people about the giants in their lives because they didn't know they were there. Particularly, uh, I have a son who works in an emergency room with doctors and PAs and NPs and all those sorts of people, and sometimes they have to tell people about the giant in their lives. What happens in an emergency room? Well, you might have somebody come in. It's a man who comes in. He is, he is in your area because he is escaping the cold of the north, and so he's come down here for the winter, and he is with his wife, and they're enjoying each other's company, but he feels a bit dizzy, and he comes in because he has some heart conditions. He wants to get that checked out. He gets checked out. No, it's not your heart. Your body is full of cancer. A giant stands up in his room. And no, you can't drive home. You would be a danger to yourself and to others. A giant stands up in his room. Or a young girl comes in. She's a, a, a high school teenager she's been involved in sports and and she somehow tweaked her shoulder and so x-rays are taken is it broken is it broken collarbone something that you just kind of strap up and it eventually heals itself maybe another visit to an orthopedic just to make sure that it it healed properly do you know that when you go into an emergency room and you're a woman of childbearing ages and they it might be possible that they would give you medication for pain or for antibiotics or anything like that they take a blood test and part of that blood test is to test whether you're pregnant or not. And so you say to her, yes, you have a, a broken collarbone, but I also need to tell you, you're also pregnant. And the giant stands up in her room and the tears begin to flow. And hopefully mom puts her arms around her and says to her, it'll be okay, baby. We'll figure this out. When the giant stands up in your room, do you have the stones to cast him out? That first stone might be those who uh, stand with us. My wife, at, some years ago, gave me a book called Balcony People. and I don't remember the whole book, but I do remember that it's about putting people in the balcony who cheer you on. Now, you can bring people into your life. Some of them will cheer you on, and others will drag you down further into the mud. You need to decide whether, whether those people in your life, which way they're pulling you. But I know also I've been to a high school track meets, and particularly middle school ones, and the kids are running around. And, there's, and because it's middle school, there are going to be some of the kids who are f way, way behind because this is just trying things out in life at this particular point. But all the people in the uh, state sitting in the bleachers are cheering on, and they're cheering on their particular child. And there's Susan, and there's Eric, and they're way behind. But they're little Groups are still cheering them on, not to win the race, but not to win, but simply to finish. Well, I guess that is a win, isn't it, to finish? And sometimes, uh, as that, when that happens, then the rest of the crowd starts uh, joining in and, and shouting for them to finish the race. Those are the kind of people you need in your life. It's one of the stones you can use to cast against that giant. Or you might have the stone of your scriptures. I think scriptures help me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. I don't know how many times I have spoken that, and it has lifted me up. Or from 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. So let the one who thinks he is standing be careful that he does not fall. 
No trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able, but with the trial will provide also a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. The promises of the scripture come back. Another stone to hurl at the giants. About the, the stone of worship. I reminded that Jesus said that, said that there was a group that came and complained that Jesus' disciples were walking through the fields on the Sabbath. They were picking off some of the heads of the, uh, of the grain and rubbing it between their hands to get off the chaff and then uh, eating the grain. And they came and complained to them because that act of rubbing off the husk was, was, um, was work, they said. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was created for man and not man for the Sabbath. God gives us that opportunity to come together and to turn our attention away from the things of the world and back to the God who created us and who always from the very beginning and all the way through the scriptures seeks to stand on our side. I really think a lot of that's what really worship is about. Remembering again the God who stands on our side and whose shadow is so long and tall and wide that it engulfs the giants in our lives. The fourth, the fourth stone that you might cast is the one of, you know, called Count Your Many Blessings and Name Them One by One. I was, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a words from an old song. But I remember there, there are times where you start to feel sorry for yourself and you start thinking to yourself, I should have done life differently here and I should have done life differently there. And then, uh, but what you need to do is start thinking about, and if that had happened, what are, the, what are the joys that I'm willing to give up in order to do life differently here or to do it there? What are the moments of victory that I'm willing to give up? Who are, who, who, whose love am I willing to turn back because I do life differently? What you're really doing is simply gathering together your blessings, and it's a stone that you can cast at that giant. And the last one, the last stone is your focus. If you go back and listen to that scripture, what you said is that all the armies that served Saul, out of all of those who served Saul, not one was ready to stand up and to do battle with the giant. You see, that was David's problem. He didn't see himself as the one who served Saul. He saw himself as the one who served God Almighty. And that that God is so tall and wide that no giant could stand against that God. The giants are sometimes tall. I have some uh, friends of mine, some years ago, um, they had a daughter who was nine months pregnant, ready to give birth, and then a son-in-law. And they had been out doing something, and they were returning home, and they were hit by another car, head on. And the driver of the car happened to be, well, he was drunk. And... Uh, as because of the accident, the daughter was killed. They, they birthed the baby, but moments after its birth, the day, baby died. The son-in-law, he had a broken leg. He should have lived, and yet he too died, I think, probably of a broken heart. Oh, did I, did I tell you that the uh, drunk driver was a priest? That's giant. And I always marveled at them, that they had faith still. And, and they would say to me, you can choose hopelessness or you can choose hope. They had gathered together their stones and they had overcome the giant in their life. And there's a giant in your life today I want you to overcome. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask a blessing upon those who have gathered with us today. And we ask that if there is some sort of giant in their life too big for them to handle, that they would understand that God is ready to stand by their side and that his shadow and his tithe and his width are such that this giant cannot stand against it. Come, Lord Jesus, and set us free that we might live the abundance that you hope. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Mm -hmm.